Welcome, friends, to the Soul Talk podcast, a show where we explore and uncover the path to the heart, amplifying your conscience. Join me as we meet incredible souls who are in this journey and learn from their experience and different methods that will make you vibrate your heart. Let's get into it. Hello, everyone. This is Monica Ramirez, the Warrior of Love. And thank you for being again here in Soul Talk. I appreciate you. And today we have a friend of mine that we, we met in person in Sedona. It was in a magical place, Brooke Ecos. And she's fascinated. You're going you're gonna to really like this conversation, guys. We're going to be talking about how to rewire your, your life. And let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Brooke. She is a trauma healing coach, rapid transformation therapist, uh, RTT, NLP practitioner. Brooke specializes in empowering survivors of, of rewriting their stories. But Brooke, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for having me on here. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. Um, yeah, I feel very passionate about the ability that we do have um, the power to rewrite our lives. We have the power to kind of change our stories. Um, I think sometimes we get really stuck in the narrative of this is who I am and this is who I have to be. And we don't really necessarily realize it. It's very unconscious. And that's kind of a little bit of my story, right? You talked a little bit about that and kind of introducing me, but um, realizing that my whole entire life, my childhood was, I didn't get to choose who I wanted to become. I was told who I had to be. I was told who, what I had to believe. So I didn't even get to choose my beliefs. Right. So it was like recognizing that looking in the past, you know, my childhood up into my teen years, um, I really was not given the opportunity to find what I even knew to be myself, my authentic self. And so that was because I was raised in, you know, in a religious environment that was a high demand control religion, you know, and we'll just call it a cult because that's really what it is. Um, this space where you're told what to do, what to think and how to believe. And if you don't conform, you're also punished and shamed. And it was the same dynamic in my home. My father was very kind of, you know, uh, more narcissistic and things were very unstable. So things were kind of dysfunctional, like where it's like, I never knew what to expect next. It was very chaotic. Um, my father was, you know, kind of couldn't control his emotions, was very angry. Um, and then also expected perfection. And if we didn't, you know, didn't, if we didn't conform to what his idea of what we should be doing or how we should be acting or, or how we should be performing within the religious uh, dynamic or in school or just up to his standards, then he withdrew love, was angry, or he shamed me. So kind of having that experience, it was, you know, like I said, it was very similar to home and in within the religion. So kind of, kind of feeling that dynamic over and over and over again, I recreated that when I got into an abusive relationship. Um, I ran away, eloped and got married at 18 years old of age and didn't realize that I was really marrying someone that was very similar to my father, had the same characteristics um, and stayed in that abusive marriage because I didn't know anything different. I had no idea. So that's a little bit about my story. Obviously, there's so much more there, but <laughs> it just shows you how uh, we can kind of get trapped in the same dynamics and keep recreating those in our life. And we're not really uh, fully aware of them. And, and that's why people always say, well, why didn't you ever leave? Why did you never leave this abusive relationship? Well, because I didn't know any different. I thought I had to stay. And, and you know, I heard something today where it says uncertainty is better than the fear of the unknown. So I was able to be okay with the uncertainty and the ups and downs of my relationship rather than leaving the relationship because then I would fear, well, what's on the other side of this? There's, there's this unknown, right? And I think that's a lot of the reason why women get really trapped in these abusive relationships too, because one, they have the threats of the abuser that says, you know, I'll take everything away from you, or I'll take the children away from you, or I'll make your life a living hell. Um, but also, this fear of the unknown. So it's almost better to just kind of stay in the uncertainty and, and just kind of be like, you know what, I'll do whatever I got to do to keep the conflict um, controlled as much as possible. And, you know, and that's where we kind of stay in complacency. 
I totally agree with you. We have a very similar story. I also was raised in the Catholic Church. I, in fact, I studied with nuns. So you mm -hmm. can imagine the indoctrination from at eight o'clock in the morning it started. And uh, you go back home and it was the same thing. So then, yes, uh, me too. I was in a, also in an abusive relationship, but I was getting beaten uh, for mm -hmm. five years. That's how it lasted. But everything comes to a point of breakup. Mm -hmm. How much I can endure. I admire, well, not admire, actually, I feel sorry for the women that stay in those kind of relationships for the rest of their lives when they're mm -hmm. getting abused, physical, mental, or, or emotional. Mm -hmm. Because there are different kinds. People think that abuse is only physical, like probably you or me, we had. Yeah. But the, the silence one, it is the mental and the emotional. Yes, for sure. That's the insidious one. That's the insidious one that you don't you don't see with your physical eye. Mm -hmm. You don't feel it with your physical eye. You don't know that's what that's what's really happening to you. But it kind of erodes like, you know, your self-esteem. It erodes like your um, cognitive ability to actually function on so many levels mentally because we have the gaslighting, right? The manipulation, the, the you know, the invalidation of our feelings, um, you know, where if you were not seen and heard in childhood, you're going to feel the same in your relationship, this abusive relationship, because they are going to never hear your side they're never going to be able to to be there for you and you you're so right in something that you say we tend to look for whatever the same image that we had as a kid we mm -hmm. tend to look for it as an act yes. so if we were in a narcissist family raising a narcissist family well we're gonna look for a narcissist mate because that's what we're used to we don't know better if someone know, do never knows, that's why I like the colors in, in the description of the colors. How do you know what it's like? If you have never seen the dark. Yeah. And it's exactly with this. If you want to experience something different, you have to step up to get out and try something new. And mm -hmm. that is where many people get stuck because change this is scary. Yeah. Yeah. Change is so scary. I love how you said that about the light and the dark, because you're so right. You really are in the darkness when you're in those relationships. And if you, if you've never understood what a healthy relationship looks like, right, that's the light, right? Like that's just the experience of, oh my gosh, this is what a, re a healthy relationship is. I mean, I remember when I met my partner, I still was so kind of, you know, let's just say I was a little damaged and broken, right? Being in that type of environment for 35 years of my life, that was my only experience of life. So coming out of that darkness, like you said, and coming into this space where, oh, wait, this is a healthy partner. What does this even look like? This is foreign. This is, this is not something that's, this doesn't feel normal to me. I still was trying to feel like, okay, well, maybe this isn't, maybe he isn't healthy, right? I was kind of projecting um, what I'd had experienced from the past onto him and recognizing that he wasn't doing any of those things. He was actually a healthy, conscious partner. And that was what kind of reflected back to me all of the healing that I needed to do because I was so wounded from all of my past experiences. And yes, we are uh, getting told all our lives who we are, what we should like and what we should not like, and what we want to experience and what we should not experience by all the authority figures in our lives. And if you were in a religious background, of course, you have not only your parents, you have your teachers, the priest, or mm -hmm. many more authority figures that you even want, because they're going to tell you that the first of the things, it is not even believing in yourself because that is egoistic. That is being yeah. narcissist. And that is, they define what is narcissism for them. And more in the old cultures and the old world, how I call it, how a woman should act and think and dress mm -hmm. and feel and so forth. And that is ending, but it's still very present. Yeah. At the same time, we can see it, we as a present mothers I have a daughter and of course I let her be completely who she is 
that is something that I wish I had. But mm -hmm. we still see it in other families that is still happening. Oh yeah, for sure. Because that was, it was a conditioning thing, you know, that's where the generational trauma kind of comes in. And it's like, um, looking back past generations, it's kind of the way that the, the, everyone evolved. And, you know, I can't even say that against my, you know, there used to, obviously there's, there's some anger there towards my parents' actions, but I can't even look at it as, um, something to be truly, angry about because that's just the way they were raised they didn't know any different they're just coming from a wounded space and and that's really what narcissism is right it's this this um this sense of self that had to become grandiose the self-image because for some reason someone made them feel inferior someone wounded them enough to make them this way they didn't, they weren't just born, <laughs> you know, of, as abusers, they were created. And so it's almost like being able to say, okay, well, we have to look at it from this space and, and look at, okay, how are we now evolving as humans to be able to reflect and see, okay, how do I, how do I not want to do what my parents did? <laughs> and I found that in myself, right? Like looking at that, like, okay, I see all what, what they did wrong. And now I get to do everything different in how I would have loved to be treated, which is you get to be who you want to be. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to shame you. You go and do you. This is your experience. This is your journey. Let's define for our viewers because the word narcissist is being thrown around so much. Yeah. That for many people really lost the meaning and and they might hear narcissists and immediately close down because like they don't want to even hear it anymore. Mm -hmm. But this is something very, very real that is still happening in many, many places in yeah. your home, in your work, with your partners, with friends, with co-workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's mm -hmm. happening so much and the people do not understand the real meaning. What yeah. is narcissism? So... Do you want me to give you a, a, a definition? Well, I don't have a Webster's Dictionary definition in front of me right now. Um, but I, I would say what a narcissist is, obviously, and just to be clear, we all have narcissistic tendencies. We're human, right? We all have this, um, uh, it's one of the human needs to have a sense of significance or a self of sense, you know, we want to feel like we're important. Um, I feel like narcissism really comes into what we call, like we were talking about earlier, like more of the dark insidious side of where it's like, it becomes too much is when this person feels so self-important that they don't care about how they treat other people. They will stop at nothing to get what they want and what they need. So if that means if they've got a you know, hurt somebody, manipulate somebody, lies to somebody, betray to somebody, or treat someone so poorly that they are abusive, right? Where they actually are physically harming someone. Um, they will stop at nothing to get what they want because they matter the most. They don't care about anybody else. They lack empathy, um, you know, and that's really when you kind of get into more of the darkness of like sociopaths and psychopaths, right? Um, where they really have literally no remorse, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I could go yeah. on forever about that. <laughs> they don't feel guilt. So they, yeah. don't, they are always going to be blaming someone else for their misery. Yes. And they're, not always, they're, they're not accountable at mm -hmm. all. And uh, they have the grandiosity, like they are superiors. So they're going to gaslight everybody in their, in their path. Mm -hmm. They are, there can be not necessarily the abuse, like we mentioned at the beginning, it is going to be physical. It's mm -hmm. going to be mental. This is more mental and emotional abuse that you're going to be receiving. So believing in yourself it is almost impossible to get out. Many people cannot get out of there because mm -hmm. they don't believe in themselves or already at all. There's a society, and even in the 2020, I, th I think the world became more narcissist. In that time, in the 2020, mm. uh, uh, I'm talking about the, the whole world yeah. because yeah. no one was thinking in themselves and for someone else or having the empathy for how the other people are feeling about this. Yeah, that's true. You're right, because everybody wanted to prove that they were right and what everybody else was saying or doing in that time was wrong, right? And I think there is um, 
there's a part of, um, you know, really kind of scaling into that narcissistic space where it's, you know, almost an unhealthy um, space is when we always feel like we have to be right and everybody else is bad or wrong. And I found that to be, which I'm going to kind of revert back into the religious space that I was in because it was very narcissistic and it's very patriarchal, the, the space that I was in. This is a lot of religions. This is not just the religion I was in. This is um, women are inferior. Only the people in my religion are superior. They're only the ones that are chosen by God. We're the only ones that are, you know, special, quote unquote, um so seeing that 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 creates narcissistic tendencies in people so thinking that everybody outside of the religion is bad they're evil they're terrible people you can't as I like so i was told that everyone was evil and you can't associate with these people and if you do you're going to be a part of these evil people and you're going to be destroyed so thinking that like that already made us like feel like we were more important it made us feel that. And, you know, in that dynamic as well, they made people, women feel inferior. The men were to be looked at. The women, the men were the only people that could have a connection to God and, and being superior and knowing what to do and how to lead the people. And the women were just there to do what they were told. So it's just interesting to see how that kind of dynamic kind of can really, um, filtrate into all areas of, of life and other spaces where people want to hold control over people. And that's just what a narcissist likes to do. They want to control and manipulate people. And another of the things of the narcissist, they are never going to admit they're narcissist. They're, they cannot see those mistakes in themselves and they don't even question that they're doing it to other human beings. Mm -hmm. So a narcissist is not going to tell you, am I narcissist? <laughs> That's something that is not going to happen. <laughs> so if someone is asking, am I narcissist? Okay, that person is not. The person that is not questioning that, it is the person that probably has the tendencies or is narcissist. And it's a mental illness. Yeah, way. it is. Let's be honest. I mean, that is it is a mental health issue, right? Because you're you're not really seeing the reality of what's going on for you and you're not in touch with who you are at all. It's just, it's become this, um, it's a self-protection, yes. you know, it, that's why a lot of people say, oh, well, the narcissists are so grandiose and they seem like they're so conceited and they love themselves so much, but deep down every narcissist I've ever known has the worst self-esteem and is really actually very broken inside. They portray something different on the outside. And the only way out of that is way in. Mm -hmm. A narcissist can't stop. This is not definitely, I have heard different, um, I've been trying to understand this because I was raised in a narcissist family. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the narcissist is not going to question anything about their actions or their words or whatever they're uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. And they have to, because they wanted to be in the control, mm -hmm. but they are capable if they wanted to do the inner work, they are capable to change, but they will have to become responsible. Oh my God, I did this. I say this. I acted in this. So like that, they can do the change. Yeah. But the problem of the narcissist is that they, I can even say it, is they're incapable to own it. They it are incapable. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, I never like to say that a narcissist couldn't change because I think everybody is capable of change. I think if someone is um, able to reflect and and see how they're hurting other people or they're doing things that are not beneficial for relationships, um, they can change, right? Um, I really think that there is capability. I know for myself, right? Like even just having this self, this go, like you said, going inward, right? Having this self-reflection, we can see how we show up in relationships because we're not perfect. We're humans, right? We're all doing something on some level that's not healthy, <laughs> like, right? Like, and so if we can be honest with ourselves, right? Radically honest, to look at ourselves, okay, well, if I'm having this uh, familiar conflict that's happening over and over again, how am I contributing to it? What's actually going on within me 
that is creating the upset because it actually the upset always starts with self. Yes, yeah. I, I agree. And how they can rewrite their story, please. Mm, yeah, how to rewrite your story. Yes, exactly. So rewriting your story is um, obviously coming back from where I was, you know, I had a lot of subconscious programming, conditioning, um, all of those things, recognizing that you don't have to sit in that same narrative of the victim. Um, you know, when I started to do this healing work, I found that I was really kind of in victimhood. Um, I felt like, you know, oh, poor me, you know, I had this abusive, uh, you know, relationship. Oh, poor me. You know, I had this um, family that didn't, you know, that only loved me conditionally, um, you know, kind of just sitting in that victimness. And that really disempowered me. That didn't help me get into, you know, this feeling of, well, oh, wait a second, I can actually thrive. Um, and that's kind of where my purpose led me was to recognize, well, okay, well, I don't actually have to be the victim of my story. I can be the victor, right? Like I can actually say, okay, well, I took all of this pain and I created purpose with it. How am I going to take this pain and create purpose? And maybe for others, it's going to look different. Maybe your purpose is, you know, you just have some of this, these stories in the and this pain and you do something small with it, right? It doesn't have to be huge. But for me, it was like, well, I need to help other people heal from this type of trauma, this complex trauma that causes this deep wounding within yourself um, and really causes, you know, you're, you not to be able to thrive. And I wanted to show people that there's another way. And by rewriting your life, it's actually rewriting those programs, that you began with to begin with that really made it didn't make any sense but you know what i mean when you began your life you got these conditioning and these programs right from zero to seven you created stories about your life you created um situations and emotions and it's being able to recognize okay i can heal from that and i can recognize that's the past and now i can be like well, wait a second those people made me feel like i was not enough but now i can be like it's okay i am enough and when you feel like you're enough, you show up for your life. And the thing is, the people that they they still in their in the victim mentality, they really think in that moment. I remember we remember when we were victims. Remember, remember yeah. <laughs> that we think that we cannot get out of it. That that's our reality, and that's who we are. We are. We have heard many times. You're weak. You are, uh, you are not enough, you're not capable. And we are always searching for that approval and that acceptance of others. Mm -hmm. So we're always trying to become enough. So we're always searching for that enough that is never gonna arrive. No. But is we're try we are people become people pleasers because we want to be accepted and we want to be loved. Yeah. And that's where many abuse, that's how we attract abusers into our lives. Yes. And that's why we're trying to prove to someone that we are lovable. Mm -hmm. And in a way, because that's why we never felt that in when we were growing up. And then usually the narcissists, they tend to look for the people that they can control and manipulate. Mm -hmm. And people that are empaths, like in our community, spiritual community, that they, they are searching for that because there's always the wonder healer. Mm -hmm. The wonder healer is, is in all of us, not because we are healers, that doesn't mean that we don't have to do the inner work. Right. Because or else it's going to be showing up and in our relationships, in our life experience, it's going to be showing up and showing up and showing up until we actually do they need work? Or we search for help because we cannot do this by ourselves. No, we cannot. Um, I learned that very early on in my journey. Um, you know, I think there was, because sometimes I think as kids, if we had an environment where we were kind of um, emotionally neglected or we didn't feel like it was safe to ask for help, um, we will become isolated and kind of loners when we're older and think it's okay I've got this I can do it all on my own 
right? And think that for some reason that we are capable of doing that. But really, when you feel like that, it's actually, you need to actually look at yourself and say, wait a second, I can't do this all on my own. I actually need support. And we are built for connection. Mm-hmm. But trauma rewires you for protection. So that's the reason why we isolate and think we have to do it all on our, on our own. And it's really important to look at ourselves and say, well, wait a second, I actually need a supportive community. And when I took that and reflected on that, okay, wait, I need to, I need a therapist. I need a coach. I need, <laughs> I need a somatic healer. Like, you know, I started to realize I need all of these experiences to really help me get through what I need to heal so I can be more in touch with myself. And I'm still on that journey. I don't know if that journey ever ends in this lifetime when you kind of begin this development journey. Um, If it does, I mean, I imagine it just always evolves, right? It just evolves into, into more and you get deeper and deeper into your psyche and understand yourself. And there's layers over layers over layers. Work with this layer and there's another layer underneath. Yeah. But how we think that we're lesser than the universe when the universe continues expanding and learning new places. Mm-hmm. So we're not lesser than the universe. So the healing and everybody has trauma. I don't the people yeah. that is that they don't have trauma do. is because they cannot see it themselves. <laughs> but mm-hmm. just birth, just giving uh, uh just coming to this world in our birth, it mm-hmm. is traumatic. We were comfortable in the darkness and in the safe place, in in the womb, we were completely safe. But we came into this uh, to to the world. It was cold. It was not a temperature. We have to feed now through our mouth. Now it is scary. We hear uh, loud noises, etc. That is traumatic for the human being. Mm-hmm. And everybody that is alive is because we already passed through that. That's the minimum trauma that the human being has. Mm -hmm. there is so much trauma you're so right about there's there's big trauma and there's little traumas and I'm sure you know because I know you're a hypnotherapist you know it going back into the subconscious stories and in the traumatic imprints of the past I mean you know some clients are shocked by what happens and what they see because they're like I didn't even know that I made meaning to that. I didn't even know that emotionally affected me. And there's smaller stories of things that happen. You know, maybe it was a sibling that made them feel less than, you know, maybe it was something their parents did that made them feel so rejected and abandoned. And it was something the parent repeatedly did, but didn't realize that they were doing it. Right. And it wasn't like something super harmful. It was just making the child feel rejection. And all of a sudden you realize that every time you feel rejected, this is a trigger for you. And as an adult, And it was because of this original story. And so just recognizing that, yeah, we all carry some forms of traumatic imprints. And these stories are being recreated all the time because it's just part of our natural state of being and our subconscious rules 90% of our life. So it's just recognizing that that's why once we are aware of them, we have this self-awareness, we can then become the observer of the stories And I'm still learning this, you know, but it's like being able to be more in tune with your body, more in tune with the reactions that you have, you know, how you, um, how you interact with other people, how you create connection, how, how disconnected maybe you are is something to look more deeply into because that could be really, um, harming you in the long run and also harming your relationships. And something that I came to understand about NLP, because I am also an NLP, Mm -hmm. uh, it is the timeline therapy. It is something that I'm fascinated by because it's so fast how you can make that shift. And you can not change what already happened, but how it's it's imprinted in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. And then you can shift it and you can rewire your your life in a way. Yeah. Rewrite the story, like rewrite, you know, rewrite the narrative. Um, And I find the more aware you also become too, and I'm sure you reckon, you know, this is um, if you have a story of, you know, I don't matter. So I'm not important. And this story is playing in the background. You're not aware of it. Okay. It's a program that's playing in the background. Anytime that story is triggered, all of a sudden you're going to be back into that same emotion and you're going to react from that. 
And um, I think that's the best thing to learn about yourself is, okay, we'll get really clear on what your stories are. When you know your stories, then you can start to rewrite them. Okay, well, wait a second. I am important. I do matter. It doesn't matter what that person is doing or what they said or how they acted. I don't even have to react to this. Um, and then you start to kind of be more in your power and be more in control of, of how you operate and how you feel. Hi, everyone. This is Monica Ramirez, the Warrior of Love. And if you have been feeling stuck where you are right now, or if you have felt that you cannot connect with others in the same language or the same emotions that you're feeling, if you're a coach, a healer, energy worker in any of those branches, maybe this is for you. Because we have felt the disconnection for the rest of our family, friends, that we cannot connect to them. And we're so afraid to actually go deep dive when we're getting triggered by our own clients because we're seeing our mirror image with them. My name is Monica Ramirez, the warrior of love, and that's my spiritual name. And I take clients from feeling confused and feeling stuck to feeling free, to feeling that they empower, they feel empowered from themselves. I created a system path to the heart that goes in three levels. And the first level, it is healing the inner child, healing the parts of us that we've been so afraid or it's very painful to do it. I have done it myself, not only with me, and I have done it with many, many of my clients that I take them to this, to this process. The second level, it is to go more into inner self, clearing the family lineage, to breaking the contracts and vows, learning deeper more about the laws of the universe. And the third level, it is learning how to channel, how to do waking up your uh, and getting online your kids, your unique gifts that the world so much needs right now. So if you wanted to know more about this, I am eager to show you and to teach you all what I know that I use every day in my life. So thank you for being here in this page. I really appreciate it. And this is Monica Ramirez, the warrior of love. Something that comes to my, uh, to remember right now to say it, it is about the ego. I bet you have some clients that tell you, hey, how can you remove the ego? <laughs> or, or how you can banish it, the ego. But I, I find the ego fascinated, fascinating because it is an amazing tool that every single human being has. Mm -hmm. Because every time it would trigger us, that's something that we have to work with ourselves. Yeah. It's not the other person that to change it. That's their own issue to change or not. Mm -hmm. But it is for us to change because it might trigger a, a memory from our past, from our childhood, something that it was deep ingrained in there in our subconscious and every time we encounter it we are going to bring it back and yep. we're going to trigger it's our teachers triggers are our teachers and that's definitely been my story it's funny that you say that I wanted to take my ego away <laughs> it's like how do I kill this thing <laughs> like, <laughs> because it was so hyper vigilant right coming from such a, a very traumatic past um you know I had sexual abuse as a child um, you know, just never feeling safe in my body, my ego, which is really the, my human intelligence that keeps me safe, keeps me alive was hypervigilant, scanning my environment, worried about me wanting to keep me safe and feeling like it had to be hypervigilant, like it had to be on hyper alert. And so I was continuing to get hijacked by that. And when I was starting to heal, I was like, God, can I just get a break? Like I can't handle these feelings in this, my nervous system dysregulation over and over and over again. But it really is just those triggers are showing you, okay, well, what's the story here? What's going on in your body? And sometimes I couldn't locate a story because sometimes it's just a somatic imprint. It's a feeling and emotion from the past that doesn't necessarily have a full story or a memory 
because it was too young, right? We were too young to process it or we couldn't process it at the time. It was just when our body and our mind didn't feel safe and was trying to protect us. And that's literally what it's doing. That's what your ego is doing. That's that part of your human intelligence that I was always told you have to coexist with it. You have to create a relationship with it to recognize, okay, I'm not feeling safe. Well, why am I not feeling safe? How do I incorporate that safety back in my body and recognize, well, wait a second, where am I? Let me get really present in this moment and see where I am, see what's going on for me right now in this moment and get back into my body. And then once you do that over and over and over, the mind learns by repetition, then all of a sudden you're able to really quiet that ego. You're able to let it kind of like say, hey, it's okay. Let's take a back seat. I'm safe. We don't always have to be so out of control. And I think that stems from nervous system regulation as well. Like that's part of, you know, not you know, we live in a very like society that's always go, 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 run, run, run. Um, we have distraction. We have the internet. We have the social media. We're like being bombarded by so much information. Our nervous systems are pretty much dysregulated all the time, unless we're really checking in with our body. We're having some mindful, you know, mindful practices. We're doing meditation. We're taking space to quiet the mind. You know, then we can start to recognize. Okay, I just realized what's going on for me right now. I'm just dysregulated, and when we're dysregulated, we can't be connected. We, when we are in trauma, and many of the human beings have noticed, I bet, that they are not in the, the conscious, not in the body. How many times we're driving in the car and we are driving, like, oh, how do I got here? <laughs> because our conscious was not in present mm -hmm. in our body to create the change. Yep. I would like to just add what you were saying is that we need to bring back our conscious to our body. Mm -hmm. I would like to you to explain a little bit about uh, somatic to our viewers because they so people do not understand they hear it also all around and they are not and some of the viewers might not know exactly what it is. Yeah. So yeah. So somatic work is really um, something that's helped me in my journey, and somatic work is really getting connected with the body and in tune with the body. Um, and I didn't recognize. I feel like I've just started to do that work in the past year is get more connected with my body. Um, I was in such a constant state of survival, which means I really wasn't using a lot of my cognitive brain, you know, which is the prefrontal cortex. I was more of in survival state. I was more in my trauma responses. Um, I lived in a state of flight all the time, hyperactivation, run, 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 go, go, go. Like I was talking about before, um, because that had been my normal. And my body and mind didn't know any different. It just, that's how it had been running for so long because I had not been in safe environments. And so I didn't recognize that, right? I had no idea how dysregulated I was until I had done deeper healing. And so when I found somatic work, it was more of, okay, well, I've done the, the hypnosis. I've done the, the normal therapy. I've done traditional therapy. I've done energy healing. You know, I've done so much. Um, when I found somatic work, which is, you know, you, you get a practitioner and they really, you know, help you get connected more into your body, what's going on in your body and gaining this awareness of body rather than just staying in the head. I didn't realize how much I lived in my head. <laughs> the body has memory. I like our head has mm -hmm. memories and we can, we can, mm -hmm. The, the program says that we only think with our head, but in reality, we're thinking with all our body. Yeah. And our body has that same memory of the trauma. Yeah. And you can heal it from the emotional state from the head, but the trauma is also impregnated in, 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 impregnated in your own body. Mm -hmm. it's your muscles, it's in your heart, in your own, and all your systems are impregnated the anger, the fear, the all those emotions are impregnated in there. And that's also one of the somatic, uh, one of the things that somatic uh, therapy do, because you need to release it or else, yes, you can erase the memory, you can change it as a therapy like you. Mm -hmm. we, can remember, we can remove it from there, but the body will remember and it will trigger it again. Yes, exactly. 
And that's the very powerful way of saying that. I think that I had come to a space in my healing journey. Okay, well, we did a lot of the rewriting, rewriting in the in the mind. We did a lot of work everywhere else, but it was now time for the body work. And so now I feel like I'm being very called to not only do somatic work, but, you know, dancing and yoga and really, you know, anywhere I can get more connected to this body. Um, that's where I feel like I'm being led in this journey. Yes. And Brooke, do you have any classes that you're teaching right now? Do you have group or how do you work with people? Yeah, so I usually work one-on-one -on -one, uh, mostly because trauma work really is more deeper. <laughs> I find that a lot of women don't really want to open up space for their trauma in circle. Um, so I do a lot of the deeper work one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And then when those women kind of graduate, if you will, and they feel like, okay, I feel like I can kind of hold space in a, in a group of women that um, I can be seen and heard in and feel validated, then I move them into what I call my Rewrite Your Life program, which is kind of working through more of that subconscious programming and, and doing some of the shadow work and getting really clear on, okay, well, how do I want my life to look? And how do I want to feel? And what do I want to embody? And just working through some of the deeper stuff, because I find that when we do things in group with other women that are on the same journey, there's so much more deeper healing and teaching within that circle as well. So once we've done, you know, that first stage of kind of working through a lot of the, the past and what's happened for them, and then moving on to that kind of group setting is really powerful for them. You are very right. Yes, not many people can are afraid to be seen and, and to be heard. Yes. And they're not trauma. in groups. Yeah, a lot of people that have had trauma are afraid to be vulnerable. And so it's first about being able to, like, okay, this is a safe space, you know, working one-on-one, -on -one, it creates that safe space and that connection again. And we start to heal a lot of that disruption that happened in all the relationships prior. And then they're ready to feel more vulnerable and be in space and hold circle with other women. And that's really my passion is getting women to that stage where they can feel, they can finally show up and be seen and talk about their feelings and talk about their experience and talk about what's coming up for them um without fear yes and and it is true uh working in groups also it is very very helpful at the same time mm -hmm. you don't realize that you had a trauma because we tend to shove it down all our traumas and bad memories because they're painful and they're scary so it is easier to shove it down but when someone presented that they leave the same thing as you do it's like oh i remember i had this one over here hiding <laughs> so let me bring it out yes I think that's what the most powerful thing is about being in a circle with women like that in a group is other women will say something And then you're right, it triggers another memory for them. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, well, that's why I do this or that's why I feel this way. And then they're able to share their experience as well. And when people feel seen and heard and validated, there is so much healing that comes up, right? Because if you can be in a group of people and you feel seen, heard and validated, you're like, oh my gosh, I finally don't feel alone. I finally feel like this is where I'm meant to be. Yes. And it is so true, something they also said. We as human beings, we don't know one that we don't need to do this work alone. Mm -hmm. We also, we belong in a community. Mm -hmm. And many of the healers, in fact, that they learn different modalities. Many of the modalities are not like NLP that you go deep inside or hypnotherapy. Many of the modalities, they're just, let me make you a healer so you can heal others, but they're not doing the inner work. Yeah, exactly. It's really important to be doing the inner work. Yes. It's, it's very important. And I think um, that's been probably the most uh, rewarding thing for myself. Difficult at times, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not always easy, um, but recognizing that it really brings more resilience and strength in yourself. And it helps you embody who you really want to be in this life. And what because uh, that is you're a coach or a healer, you have not done the inner work, you're going to project that to your clients. Mm -hmm. You're going to judge them, you're going to fear them, you're going to, and because they're triggering your own memories because you have not done the inner work. Mm -hmm. Yes, very true. 
So that is why it's so important that if they're a coach or they're a healer, or even someone that is starting to, trying to change their life in a way, they're trying to rewrite, okay, I don't have to live this mm -hmm. life that I don't like. You don't yeah. have to exit the life. You can change it in here. You can yep. change this life and your life experience can be very, very different how it looks in this moment. Yeah, exactly. I think that because you, you said that that's perfectly said because you said earlier, right? Change is scary. So a lot of people are afraid to rewrite their life. They're afraid to change the story because they're they're afraid of the unknown, right? Um, but being able to know that, okay, well, once you start to make those slow steps to change and really feel how you want to feel and really get clear on how you want your life to look, then you're not going to accept anything less. Yes, I love that. I love that. So uh, people, uh, do the groups, they cannot just jump in into your groups or they just have to get uh, first one-on-one -on -one with you first or how yeah. do you work with them? Just contact me one-on-one -on -one first. We kind of have a chat, see where you kind of are and what, what you're needing to kind of work through and see where you fit. And, you know, then we can talk from there and see what is going to be most beneficial for your own healing journey. And uh, and I would like just to to ask you a little bit about uh, that you're a fervent advocate against religion abuse and domestic violence. Well, the domestic violence we already talked, but uh, the the religious abuse. Mm -hmm. I I do want to to mention this. I am not into any religions. I used to be, like I mentioned before, but I do believe that some human beings they need the religion. To be a good person because mm -hmm. there are people who have more psychopaths and, <laughs> and killers in the streets if they don't fear at least like oh I cannot kill someone because I will go to hell <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're right you're probably right about that for sure I think um yeah I feel like religion has a place for some people yeah. where I have a problem with it is when religion is using indoctrination and control Um, and you know, there's a majority of religions that are out there like that. I think that religion has evolved even over the past, like 10, 15 years, where there's some, you know, there's some churches where it's not like that. It's more of like, you know, I've seen these non-denominational churches or whatever. It's just like, come and be in community, like come and just be a part of our, you know, space and show love to other people, meet people, right? It's not about, um, this, you have to act this way or do this to be accepted, Um, and that, that is okay. But I think some people do need more of a structured space, like a, a space where they can have um, people because we really need connection. And a lot of people are alone, yes. right? So they need something like that. So I completely understand with that. Um, is that for me? No, it's not for me. I don't feel, you know, it's, it's after coming from a, a space where I was controlled by religion, I'm very anti anything like that but I don't judge it I just it is what everybody else needs right I just know that um I know that I have my own spiritual connection with God universe um and have created that over the years even though I didn't know necessarily what that was going to look like <laughs> but we can say that because you don't need a religion because you are aware Of your own thoughts and your own emotions and how to work it out in yourself so you don't project that to others yeah but not everybody is aware of their own thoughts and emotions or even whatever they say and they're gonna hurt others mm -hmm. so it is important that that one of the big things about that i don't like about religions is to control and manipulate others they instigate fear Yes. And everything is going to be hell. Everything is going to be devil. Or everything is going to be scary. And that's mm -hmm. one of the ways that they use to control, manipulate other human beings. Yeah. And that's abuse because controlling people by fear is abuse. Um, that's the same relationship that you have with an abusive man or woman. They control you by threats, by threatening you, by fear, by um domineering you by controlling the finances whatever it is right they're controlling you in some way and when a religion is trying to control you and manipulate you that's abuse 
And that's, you know, the environment that I grew up in and didn't realize. And I was so faithful to that religion. So faithful. I believed it with all my heart. And so when I realized that the religion was a sham and I was being controlled that way, I felt very angry at God. Like, and I was like, I don't even know if there is a God because if he could control, if, if he could, if I thought this was real, I thought this was the truth. I thought it was, um, you know, what was I, how I was supposed to act. And then it wasn't. And I felt like, well, I don't even know what to think anymore. So for a long time, I just ignored it. I just ignored it. I left and I ignored the whole concept of God and just said, well, I have no idea what to think. And I'm just going to avoid even thinking about it because it's too much for my brain to even think about. And that's when I had my own spiritual awakening in 2020. And I, you know, it really is really ignited by grief over my loss of my ex-husband, which is the father of my children. And that's when I started to be like, okay, well, what are we doing here? <laughs> Where did my ex-husband go? Is he, you know, is he dead forever? Is, you know, what really happens to us? You know, it made me question everything again. And that's when I kind of had that awakening to kind of look deeper and ask questions. And every, the more I asked, the more I received. Yes. Yeah. And yes, I, you're totally right. And, uh, and many religions tend to do those kind of things, but God did not even start the religion. Humans did with the filters that everybody have, every single humans, including us, we have our own filters and if we read the same paper, you're going to interpret it in one way and I'm going to interpret it in a different way. And God did not even wrote the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. It was man and everybody said it was inspired by God, right? Um, and I, I think there's so much to be said about the Bible. I think a lot of it's metaphoric, a lot of it's stories. Um, you know, and I think that we've interpreted them to mean whatever we want them to mean. And a lot of religions have taken them and, and, and interpreted the scriptures the way they want to interpret them. And they've taken stuff out, right. And then not told their followers. Um, you know, there's just so much that's been kind of twisted, I would say. And I think the part of the journey is kind of seeing what resonates for you, not what someone tells you to believe. What do you actually believe? And if someone's telling you what to believe, well, I would dig deeper and say, wait a second, I shouldn't have to be told by someone else. I actually can find this information out all on my own. Yes. Oh. I question everything. Question everything. And I never thought, including us right now, question yeah. yourself. But question also every single thought and emotion that you have, because then you can make the change. Yeah, completely. I agree yes. with you. Do you have uh, last words that you would like to say before we, we close down the this episode. Yeah, I would love to just say for anybody that is, you know, if someone's listening out there and they have either suffered from an abusive relationship or still in an abusive relationship and they feel like they want to get out, they're unhappy, they're unfulfilled, they recognize that something's not right, um, be curious. Know that um, you have another way that you don't have to stay complacent, you don't have to stay, you feel like you're trapped. Um, even if you're in the most dire situations, there's so many avenues that you can go and so much help out there to help you get out of the situation that you're in, even if you feel like you're all alone. Um, I just want people to know that um, they are powerful and that the more that they can recognize that and have the strength to see that, that they can kind of break free from those chains that are holding them back from, from living a life that has more meaning and more purpose. That is so true. The information of Rook is going to be down below this video or the audio. So like that, you can uh, get a hold on her or you can chat with her about her coaching because we don't have to do this alone, guys. We can't, we, it is daunting. In fact, if you try to do this alone because we all have blind spots that sometimes when someone pointed at us, we can observe those blind spots that we have. So it is important to search for help. There's always help when we really want to open it to, for that help. And, uh, and I just wanted to remind you everybody about the, we're opening the membership for Path to the Heart in January. 
So if you want more information, it is going to be also the link so you can uh, book a call with me. My name is Monica Ramirez, the Warrior of Love. And share this video, please, and give us a like. We we'll appreciate that. Thank you very much. This is Monica Ramirez. Thank you for being in Salt Talk. Mm -hmm.